Well, good morning, and welcome to Frederica Baptist Church this morning. So good to see you here. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord together as we come today to praise, to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you will, please stand with us. We're going to begin by singing our patriotic medley uh, as we have Veterans Day coming up uh, this week and just want to thank God for the country that he has given us and blessed us with. So let's sing, lift our voices to him, sing our gratitude to him. seated and let's watch our video together. The eleventh hour does not strike on the clock of every man. For at this time most of us can be found at home, comfortable, knowing tomorrow is right on its way. At the eleventh hour, most of us can be found in our beds. But in another world, our men and our women, our brothers and our sisters live in this hour. Tick, 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 tick. Every second for you. Every second. For me, men of the eleventh hour. So today, it's our turn. It's our turn to show our gratitude. It's our turn to applaud when they stand. It's our turn to thank God for you. Mm. 
let's, uh, let's have our veterans stand, shall we? If you're a veteran, please stand. Absolutely. Please remain standing. And let's have a time of prayer for our men and women in uniform that are serving around the world right now, shall we? Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for the men and women who, who go where our country directs them to keep us safe. Lord, we thank you for their sacrifice, uh, not only of, of their time away from home, but many, many times for their lives. Lord, we are thankful for them. We pray that you would protect them, that you would allow them to know that you, they are being prayed for. And Lord, as always, we pray that you would draw them closer to yourselves, that as they face down an enemy hiding in a bush, Lord, that they would know that their eternal lives are safely tucked away in your hand. Lord, we lift these men and women up to you. We place them in your arms, knowing that you love them more than we ever could. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So, it's that time again. And uh, we have a whole bunch of these boxes. I think we ordered a hundred of them. And uh, lots of them have been put together. They're out in the foyer. They're in the fellowship hall. And uh, next week is the week that we want you to bring them back. So if you're having your mind, yeah, I need to get one of those boxes. I want to do one of those. Now's your chance. Uh, if you want to come up during the week and get one, we have them as well. Uh, but uh, this is a fun way to uh, just send the love out to... Uh, to kids around the world. And so I encourage you to grab one or two or six of these boxes and uh, fill them up. Get the little, uh, the little thing that goes on front, uh, I guess label that says if it's for a boy or girl and the age and, and, and do that appropriately. Uh, I know Brenda has put a wonderful display out there to kind of show you the things to put in there. Uh, but I encourage you. Uh, this is one of the things that we're going to be doing this holiday season. Uh, we're going to do some other things. One of the things uh, that we're going to do uh, that you'll see is going to be an angel tree for some, uh, some uh, girls in a school in Bangladesh. Uh, and so you'll be able to take one of those and, and be able to help uh, that little girl and her family. These are, this is a school that some friends of Amy and I uh, run in Bangladesh, and it's a, it's a wonderful little thing. We'll also have the Lottie Moon offering coming up, so I encourage you even now to start praying to God to, to tell you what would be your part in, uh, in giving to uh, Southern Baptist International Missions. And so that'll start the 1st of December. So there's a lot coming up in this holiday season, uh, and so I encourage you to, uh, to be aware of that and to uh, make your plans uh, even now. All right, let's pray as we begin our worship service. Father God in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would be with us this morning. I pray that you would just meet us here today, that your spirit would be active in this room. Uh, Lord, as we sing, as we pray, uh, Lord, as we listen to the message that you have given me, Father, I pray that you would just open our ears and you would open our hearts and that our praise would be uh, just overwhelming. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together again as we lift our voices together in worship. We're going to read some scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5 for our call to worship. So let's read this together this morning. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And that's what we want to do. We want to just worship our God and love on him as we lift our voices together. Love the Lord. Lift your voices to him now. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your
With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, I will love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. Amen. Give the Lord a hand and praise him this morning. He deserves all of our praise. We should love him, all that we are, all that we have. We ought to build our lives on him, his word, continue to sing to him, and worship him as you sing this straight to him. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There my eyes in wonder 
of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Father, may that be all of our prayer, our sincere prayer, that we live our lives for you because you are alone are worthy of all the love and all the glory and all the worship that we can give. And you are so worthy of us living our lives for you. Help us to do that. We pray that our offerings of worship and song please you glorify you. So we worship you and we pray all in your precious name, Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Very nice. Thank you, choir. Thank you all, our instrumentalists. Well, Amy and I had a, a wonderful time away uh, this week. We went down to Amelia Island uh, and uh, really did a little bit of nothing, and that was nice. I, I know for many of you this was an absolutely horrible week. Uh, I just, I know the disappointment. I'm not talking about the elections, I'm talking about the Georgia game. Um, <laughs> I, I have debated um, about what to say about the elections. Um, I don't like to be political at all. Um, you know, I've said this over and over again. My focus uh, is on Jesus. Um, but it is, it's the elephant in the room, if you will. And I know many of you are disappointed. Uh, many of you are upset. Uh, some of you may think the fix is in. That's what my dad said. Um, many of you are relieved. Some of you are, are happy. Our country, as I think not since the Civil War, uh, stands divided. Uh, there's no clear mandate out of this election at all. Uh, it wouldn't be either way it went. Uh, it, it wouldn't have mattered. We need to come together. We cannot be divided. We need to go out in the world with a different message. And so we need to let this whole election thing go. Because God is in control. And who is going to be in the White House is who God has placed in the White House, for good or bad. You know, God, God brings uh, men to power to, to punish uh, as well. And so I'm not saying that's what's happening, but um, absolutely not. Uh, we need to come together. And when all the dust settles, whoever is our president is who we need to pray for and who we need to respect and who we need to pull for, that he will do what is best for our country. When we were playing, singing the song, uh, America the Beautiful, uh, you know, that's a song that should lift us up. And yet I found that I was grieving in my spirit instead because there's not much beauty left. I think there's a lot of ugliness and a lot of hatred, and it's brother against brother, sister against sister, and that's unfortunate. And so into this void, let us inject Jesus. Let us inject the gospel. Let us be the shining light on the hill that the Puritans believed is what America would be, that light has gone out, unfortunately, and so the light of the church needs to take its place. I'm not saying that we don't respect our veterans and we don't pull for America. It is our country, but we are aliens here. We are foreigners, and we need to stand as ambassadors for the true kingdom. And that's all I'm going to say about politics. We are going to be looking today at Genesis chapter 19. Actually, we're going to start with a little bit of Genesis 13 and then chapter 19. So you can uh, turn to both of those. They're probably just a couple pages apart. Stick your fingers in there. Chapter 19 of the book of Genesis can be a very dark and difficult read. And of course, I was working on this sermon during all of this upheaval of the election, and it made it even more dark for me. And so what I want to do today, I usually wait a little bit till we read the scripture, but I want to begin today with prayer. I want to begin with prayer for our country moving forward, for our church moving forward, for each and every one of you. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat or somewhere in between. We need to come together in love, and we just need to let all that other stuff go, okay? Don't get on Facebook, and, you know, don't, don't buy into all that stuff. Just let it go, and let's think about Jesus 
okay? So let's pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, we lift you up. We lift you up on high. We place you on the throne that is your right as you are the only one worthy to occupy that throne. So God, today, we bow to you in humble worship. Lord, we lift our hurts and our disappointments, our, our, our unsettled spirits up to you. And Lord, we pray that we are walking in the center of your will. Lord, I pray that you take this church, Frederica Baptist Church, and you increase its voice and you magnify its reach, that we would go out to this entire island of St. Simons, even into Brunswick, out into Georgia, and to the uttermost parts of the earth with your message today, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, as we look at our country, as we look at where it has fallen to, Father, we pray we pray that the men who, and women who have been uh, now voted into places of power, Lord, that they would look to you. And if they don't know you, Father, send a preacher to tell them the good news that they might know that you are the king on high, the emperor of all empires, the Lord of all lords. God, we pray that they would seek your face and that they would make godly, moral decisions based on you and your word. Lord, I mourn for the unborn. I mourn for those who cannot help themselves, in which a wayward government would take their lives. God, forgive us. Father, I pray for the, the judges in our courts, I pray for the congressmen and women, the, the senators. I, I pray for the governors and the, the assemblymen and women. And Lord, make yourself known on this earth in a new and mighty way. God, 2020 has been a horrible year. And as we move into this next year, I pray, Lord that your great light would shine not only on this country but on the entire earth and that that light would bring people to you. Father, I can't help but feel that our time on this earth is short. Lord, we need to get ready for you so that when you appear in the heavens with your mighty host and with the sound of trumpets, Lord, we can look up with joy and we would rise up to the clouds to meet you. God, fill me today as you give us this message out of this dark chapter in man's history. And Lord, today as we hear about Sodom and Gomorrah, we cannot help but to compare them to our own society. God help us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, in chapter 19, we read about Sodom and Gomorrah. And we read about Abraham's nephew, Lot. And he's living in this sordid, city of Sodom. We read about the flight of Lot and his family prior to the destruction of these cities. And we read about the incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters as he is in this drunken haze. When you finish reading this chapter, chapter 19, I think we could all easily conclude, well, I won't be seeing Lot in heaven. <laughs> There's one guy I know is not going to make it. But when we look in the New Testament, over in 2 Peter, the Apostle Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit himself, calls Lot a righteous man. 
He says, Lot was oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men whose righteous soul was tormented day after day with their lawless deeds. You think, what? But here's an encouragement for us. God alone knows the hearts of every person. God is saying that Lot had been justified by his faith just like Abraham was. And he lets us know through Peter that even though Lot was greatly tainted by Sodom's wickedness, Lot did not participate in it. Apparently, Lot's conscience troubled him at what he saw around him. But what we see in this chapter is that his conscience was not troubled enough to cause him to leave this great city of wickedness. Today we're talking about being conformed or conformity to the society around us. Lot evidently tried to restrain the evil men from their intended sin against these heavenly visitors. But then in that chapter, we see that he literally had to be dragged away from the city before its destruction. And unfortunately, by the end of the chapter, we see that Lot suffered tragic consequences for his conformity and association with this evil world. This needs to be a lesson to all believers. It is not one that we can skip over because we're uncomfortable reading it. We live in a wicked and corrupt world. And when we live in conformity to this evil society, Tragic consequences await us. And so we don't want anyone to be misinformed or to not know the truth. Now, our story, as I said, begins back in Genesis 13. So if you're in 13, look at verses 5 through 7 there. Now, Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose among Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. So let me jump over just a couple chapters there. Basically, Abraham says, okay, Lot, let's separate. Let's keep the peace. You take whatever part of the land you want. If you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. Then in, uh, in verse 10, it says, Lot looked up and he saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt towards Zoar. And so Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. And the two men parted company. And Abram lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked And we're sinning greatly against the Lord. So what we see here is that Abram, at this time, not quite Abram yet. But Abram realizes that he and Lot's flocks and herds and herdsmen and all of their possessions had gotten too great to be in the same place. And so being gracious, he says, Lot, you choose. You go wherever you want. I'll go the other direction. And Lot looks around, and he sees the plain of the Jordan. Now, (coughs) if you're familiar at all with the the, uh, geography or the topography of of Israel, uh, you have the Mediterranean coast that comes in. You have the lowland, and then the land goes up, and it's it's hilly and rocky and, and everything. And that's where most of the cities are, Jerusalem. You always hear in the Bible, you go up to Jerusalem. It's not because they're going north. It's because they're literally going up. Uh, it's up in the mountains. It's up on a hill. And then you go down 
the, uh, into the valley of the Jordan River. And, of course, that's where the water is, and the land is lush, and, and, and that's where some of these great civilizations early on uh, planted themselves. And so Lot, I imagine, they're up on the hills. They're looking around, and, uh, and Lot says, well, I'm going down there. You know, there's lots of water, there's lush grass, it's a great place for all of the uh, herds and everything, and it says he pitched his tents near Sodom. And so there was also excitement down there. One of the things I want you to notice here is that Lot was a herdsman. He, he, he had sheep and goats and uh, camels and donkeys and other things like that. He was a herdsman. But where did he choose to live? He lived in the city. He lived in Sodom, in a place where he did not belong. Right? Didn't belong there. I think many believers in our day are vainly trying, like Lot, to live for this world. To live what they have in this world, for what they have, for what they can get, for the excitement, for the adventure. But this world is a place where we do not belong. Hey, we... Modern believers, we, we, get, we hear this all the time. We get told by, by modern evangelists that Jesus wants us to prosper in the here and now. He wants us to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. He'll help us overcome our personal problems. He'll help us reach our goals to succeed in life and in marriage and in business. And they also throw heaven in there as kind of an added bonus. And so people sign up for the success with Jesus. Not realizing that what Jesus actually promised is hardships and trials if you follow him. You see, in the Bible, the main reason for trusting Christ is that he will deliver us from the wrath to come. Not that we're going to have a happy, wealthy life here. And that wrath to come will be mild. Or, or, I'm sorry. The wrath that we see on Satan, will, on Sodom, will be mild compared to God's coming judgment of our culture and our society. Got my tongue twisted there. Sorry about that. Let's turn to chapter 19 now. Looking at this conformity to the world. Let's see... What lessons we can learn from this dark chapter now that we have uh, a beginning there? The first thing I think we see when we read this chapter is that the world is thoroughly corrupt. Look at Genesis 19, verses 4 through 11. Uh, Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. This is Lot's house. So he was no longer living in a tent. He was now in the city, uh, living in a house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. And Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him. He said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. And they kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Listen to me. Sodom gives us a picture of the world without God. It's an ugly picture. Just reading that may have been shocking to some of you. 
to hear it in church. But this is God's word, and he wants us to see this picture, to see this society without God. It is an ugly, repulsive place. It wasn't safe to be on the streets after dark. And this wasn't only the young men, but it was even the old men who were living to satisfy their sexual and violent lusts. Ugly. But on another level, Sodom, like our society, had its attractive side. For that time, it was sophisticated and it was prosperous. The prophet Ezekiel described Sodom as, an, as arrogant with abundant food and comfortable security. Now tell me that doesn't sound familiar. Arrogant with abundant food and comfortable security. It's one of the things we sing about America, right? Maybe not the arrogant part, but most of the world would agree with that statement. Even when these heavenly visitors, these angels, struck the Sodomites blind. Now, the Hebrew word there means to be temporarily confused in a daze. So it wasn't necessarily blind. It was like they, didn't, they were, didn't know what was happening all of a sudden. But instead of those men repenting, what did they do? It says they wearied themselves stupidly trying to persist in their sin. Tell me why God would bless America. How do we say America the beautiful? It certainly was at one time. So even with the evident corruption in our own society, doomed for destruction just as Sodom was, why do many Christians live in conformity to our corrupt world. And I'm just going to say it up front. We all do this. Myself included. Absolutely included. Like Lot, much of the American church has moved into downtown Sodom. It's where we want to be. It's comfortable there. It's attractive. It's exciting. There's abundant food. There's comfortable security. We are so surrounded by its stench, we don't even notice it anymore. There's a quote by a 19th century Anglican cleric. His name was William Griffith Thomas that I came across. He said this, a ship in the water is perfectly right, but water in the ship would be perfectly wrong. The Christian in the world is right and necessary but the world in the Christian is wrong and disastrous. Mm. Friends, we must recognize the signs of corruption. And, 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 and we need to follow the Apostle Paul's advice in Romans 12 too. He said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To recognize and to resist the lure of this corrupt world and to be renewed in our minds. What do we have to do? We need to saturate ourselves with God's word. We need to let his word transform us into a new creation that is no longer corruptible but incorruptible. Let's look at some of these signs of conformity to the world. I don't want anybody jumping up. <laughs> Just judge yourself, okay? Ladies, don't judge your husbands. Husbands, don't elbow your wives. This is for personal reflection, okay? Signs of conformity to the world. Number one. You're living for the same goals as the world. 
Lot moved to Sodom for the same reason that other people moved to Sodom. To get ahead. To get ahead financially. To get rich. He didn't go there to reach Sodom for God. He went there to get rich just like everybody else because that's where it was all happening. Paul warned in 1 Timothy 6, 9, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. It's been observed that often the only difference between Christians and their pagan neighbors is that we hang around church buildings a little more. Hmm. You see, we've reduced Christianity to a little more than a spiritual crutch to help us through the minefields of our upwardly mobile life. Think about when you pray to God. Do you you drop to your knees and pray to him when things are going really good? Probably not as often as when something's going wrong, right? Help us, God. Help us through this time. Heal me. Help me. Help them. Help my children, whatever. We think that God is there to help us get our promotions, to help us get our house in the suburbs, to help us get our bills paid, and he is. But unfortunately, we've made God our co-pilot in reaching our agendas instead of the other way around. How are our goals in life different from those of our neighbors who don't know Christ at all. Number two, we're situational in our morals. At first, it looks as if Lot has avoided the moral pollution of Sodom, right? We have this testimony from Peter as well. But when the men of the city try to force The two visitors outside. Lot goes out and says, no, my friends. Calls them friends. No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. So he's trying to to convince them not to, this is wrong. This is bad. But what he says next is absolutely unbelievable, is it not? He offers them as two virgin daughters to rape or do whatever they want with as they please. He was trying to prevent one awful sin by suggesting another awful sin. You see, he was setting aside his morality because of a pressing emergency. Now... I doubt that this was a normal practice for Lot. I don't think he normally did this type of thing. But somehow, both Abraham and Lot recognized these men as messengers from the Lord, recognized them as as angels or, or, or something special that had been sent from God. And so in an effort to protect them, he offers up his daughters in this emergency situation. You know, the sad thing about this, the, the men didn't get the daughters because the, the heavenly visitors stepped in, but his daughters learned this situational ethics or this situational morality lesson very well because later in the chapter, when they thought they had an emergency situation, they took action, right? They got their father drunk, and then they got pregnant by him. It was no longer a moral problem for them because they allowed their morals to become situational. Well, hey, we're the only people left on earth. We've got to repopulate the earth. It's easy (laughs) 
to have moral standards when the pressure's off, right? It's easy to, no, no, I don't do that, when there's really no pressure pushing you. I mean, you know, if somebody walked in right now and, uh, and handed me a beer, no problem saying no. I'm in front of my congregation. I'm not going to drink a beer. Now, I'll confess, I've, I've never drank a beer. I can't even imagine it smells bad just to begin with. But suppose I had that proclivity. It'd be much easier to say okay if I was in a bar surrounded by everybody else drinking beer. You see, my, my morals become situational as to what's going on. It's easy to make up excuses for why what was formally wrong is now okay. Uh, we do that all the time. Might be when you do your taxes. I don't know. What is wrong for everyone else might be all right for you because of your unique situation, what, what you're going through in life. These are the times that we need to stop and say, look out. Because if we easily change our morals to adapt to the situation that we are in, then we are blending in with the world. Number three, we're more concerned with our status or our success than we are with our family. Lot was willing to sacrifice his daughters to save his guests because of this strong social custom of hospitality, which meant you protected those who come under your roof at all cost. But in Sodom, there was real no social stigma connected with sexual immorality. So I'll protect these men, but I'll give you my daughters because nobody's going to really care anyway. And so to protect his status in the community, which we know Lot had status because when the visitors come, they find him at the gate. That's where the leaders of the community would sit, would sit at the gate. So Lot was not only in this community, he was a leader of the community. And he wanted to protect his status. And he would do that even at the expense of his daughters. Now, I don't think any of us would do what Lot did. Right? I never had daughters. I had three sons. But when we were in Thailand, it was a steady stream of men with their daughters coming in, uh, wanting to marry their daughters to our sons. Now, that would have really cemented our relationship with the community there. But it was crazy, right? I'm not going to do that. Of course, when we, you know, worked down from the oldest to the youngest, turned them all down, then they were like, well, how about you? My wife was always sitting right next to me. You see, morals are fluid in a lot of places. The true morals come from the character of God. What do you think of when you hear of someone being wildly successful? You know, millionaire, billionaire. Do you, do you think, oh, that man must have raised his family to fear the Lord? Certainly. That's why he made it financially. Is that what you think? <laughs> Not usually. It's unfortunate that success with our families doesn't carry the same weight in our culture that success financially or social status does. It, it just doesn't. Oh, he's on his third wife. Oh, look how much money he's got. He's a titan in, in business. When we buy into that view, that status or, or, or success is more important than our family, then we are conforming to this world. Number four, we're not respected by the world for our beliefs. 
Now, you might think that's a little weird. In all the years that Lot had lived in Sodom, there may have been a few times when he tried to tell his friends about God. And I think there probably weren't many because now, in a crisis, he weakly tries to tell the Sodomites that they're wrong. Do they listen to him? Oh, well, if Lot says it's wrong, it must be wrong. No. No, they don't. They, they don't respect him at all. He doesn't even have the credibility with his future sons-in-laws to get them to leave with him. He th they think he's joking around. The reason that nobody believed him was that his, all of a sudden his concern was so out of character that they saw no reason to be alarmed. Certainly not about spiritual matters. This is Lot. It's just, it's Lot. It's him. It's just, he's another one of us. For years, he lives quietly in Sodom, pursuing the same goals as everyone else. So now, all of a sudden, it looks like he gets religion, and nobody believes him. Nobody wants any part of that. Now listen, there will always be mockers in the world. Always. And, and right now, in our divided society, they are very loud. Very loud. Stand up for the rights of life to the unborn and see what happens. Well, we can do it in here, but do it out there. And you're mocked. And you're, you're, you're told that you're intolerant, that you don't care about women's lives. No committed Christian will win a popularity contest in his job. Well, maybe I would. <laughs> Depends on who's voting, I suppose. But there's a difference between being liked and being respected. There will be times when I say things up here that you will not like. But I hope my life means that you still respect me because at least I'm true to my beliefs. When the world doesn't respect us for our Christian stand, it may be because we've lived like them for so long that it seems so out of character for us to suddenly be so concerned about God and morals. How tragic. You see, because the world may not like our viewpoint, but I believe that if we live consistently before them, they will at least respect us enough to hear our viewpoint. Number five, even in the face of destruction, it's hard to give up the world. <laughs> this is certainly true. Look at uh, verses 15 and 16. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. And when he hesitated, the men grasped his hands and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them to safety out of the city. For the Lord was merciful to them. Lot had to flee so that he wouldn't be destroyed with this wicked city. Yet it says he hesitated. The angels had to drag them to safety. Jesus talks about the same thing in Matthew 6, 21. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, because our hearts always follow our treasure. And what that means is we need to be very sure what our treasure is. Is it our bank accounts? Is it our nice homes? here on this island or over in Brunswick? Is it our cars? Or is it our family? Is it our faith? Is it our Lord? What's your treasure? Because that's the way your heart's going to go. The 
The doctor may tell you that if you keep working at the pace you're going right now to get ahead, you're going to have a heart attack and die. But you're not sure that you want to slow down. You're not sure that you want to give up that financial success, that position that you've attained, even if it costs you your life. That is a sign of conformity to the world. Number six, you keep a little bit of sin in your life. Look at Genesis 19, 18, and 20. But Lot said to them, no, my lords, please. Your servant has found, if your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life, but I can't flee to the mountains because this disaster will surely overtake me and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to and it's small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. The town of Zoar, which means little. <laughs> Lot and his wife and his two daughters were reluctant to leave Sodom. So they were dragged out by the two angels. And the angels urgently say, run, run to the mountains, get away from here. But incredibly, Lot wants to try and negotiate with them. There's a bargain with them to keep a little bit of his old way of life intact. He thanks them for their mercy in saving him, but he protests that he can't flee to the mountains. That would just be too much. You're asking too much of me, God. Instead, he wants permission to go to this small town nearby. The implication being, I think, that since the town was small, its sins wouldn't be as bad as Sodom. All right, let's not be too hard on Lot, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm beating up on him right now, but, but let's, let's look at ourselves because we all do this. Every one of us in this room, we do this. We try and keep just a little bit that we should surrender to the Lord. We become Christians. And God begins to confront things in our life that have to go if we want to truly follow him. And so what do we do? We scramble around trying to preserve as much of that old life as possible. Old friends, old uh, habits, old things. Even while God is saying, you must flee. I'm trying to save you. Run from these things. They're pulling you down to hell. There is a cost of conformity. Verses 23 through 26. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. This wasn't a volcano that erupted. Thus he overthrew those cities in the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. A few summers ago, Amy and I visited uh, Pompeii. You know, Pompeii that was buried by Mount Vesuvius, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. They've cleaned up probably two-thirds of that city, gotten all that the dirt and ash and everything out. And, and it's amazing to walk around on those streets looking at these uh, houses that have just been preserved under all of these layers of, of ash and, and dirt for centuries. It's amazing. Even the, the, the murals on the walls, you could see them. But what was truly eerie about that experience was seeing the plaster casts of people who were too slow getting out of the city after the eruption. Uh, there weren't any, really anything left of them, but they were like cavities underneath the ash. And so they would fill up the cavities with plaster, and you could see these people who were, you know, had ducked down to try and save themselves from this great heat. I wondered when I was there 
that if that's kind of what happened to Lot's wife when she turned back. It says it was a pillar of salt. Uh, read different things. You know, she turned back. The heat was so great. Sucked all of the uh, moisture out of her body, and all that was left was the, was the sodium, the salt content of your body. I don't know. She was reluctant to leave in the face of destruction. She didn't want to leave, and she turned back to her old life. And she paid the price. Lot, who tried to gain it all, who took the best of the land, who wanted to live in this successful and exciting city, lost it all. Lost his wife. He lost his sons-in-law. He lost his home. He lost all of his flocks and herds because they were out in the plain, which it says was destroyed. His daughters were irreparably tainted by Sodom's moral corruption. His grandsons from this, these uh, in, incestuous relationships uh, became the father of nations that became historical enemies to Israel. The Moabites, the Ammonites. And the last we hear of Lot, he's living in a cave, drunk. The cost of conformity to this world will have tragic consequences for believers. The allure of the world can be very appealing. And society, what do they tell us on the TV every time you see a, a commercial? You deserve it. You deserve this life. It's almost Christmas time. Sir, soon, soon you're going to see those commercials uh, where the husband or the wife is giving the husband a Lexus. <laughs> right. We are not of this world. We are citizens of a different kingdom. Our treasure awaits us elsewhere. Let's pray. Ooh, Lord, you have stepped on our toes today. God, I pray. Lord, I pray that we would not go home beaten and depressed, but that we would truly look at what you have given us and what we have taken. God, I pray that we would properly place our treasure where it belongs. That, Lord, if there is something that is holding us back, be it money, or status, or some sin or habit, Lord, I pray that each and every one of us in this room would today surrender that to you, that we would get rid of it, do whatever we need to do in order to be right with you, in order to be in rhythm, in sync with you. That is so hard, Lord. It is so hard because we look around at all the things we love we look around at all the things that we cherish. And we realize that some of them might be, be, might be getting in front of you. God, give us strength. Give us purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to sing. Jesus, keep me near the cross. And that is certainly where we need to be. We've got a great crowd here today. I, I stopped counting at 60. I don't know, where are we? About, about that? 68? Yeah, it's awesome. We've still got some empty chairs. If more people want to come. And listen, if you're here today, and you need to do some business with God, whether it's your salvation whether it's something that is holding you back, getting in between you and God, now is your opportunity. Now is your opportunity to just close your eyes, talk with him. We're going to sing. 
But you deal with Jesus. And, 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 and I invite you to come up as well. Come up. Let us know of your decisions. Let us know I am giving my life to Christ today. Let us know I have made a decision to reconnect with him today. Maybe you want to join the church today. Maybe you want to be a part of this amazing fellowship of believers. We're moving forward. I know we meet in a basement. But God has given us room up there. And I think Rick told me he's hoping the first of the week they're actually going to put the concrete in. I've been saying that for weeks, but, you know, we've had some things. This is a wonderful place to be. This is a wonderful place to learn and to grow. So if you want to join us, I, I come as well. If you need to just come up here in front of everybody, get on your knees and give yourself to God, give over this sin or whatever, this is your opportunity. I invite you to come. So Paul, let's, let's sing our song of invitation or response. Jesus, let's pray. keep me near the cross. it had gotten so late. I, I hope that some of you have spoken with the Lord today. I hope that you've allowed his spirit to fill you and to start sweeping out all those little dirty corners that we, we all try to keep protected. I invite you now to go to one of our life groups. Um, you guys are meeting today. Good. Okay. The Carlsons are back. So uh, Carlson's class will be in here, here. Mel will be over in the fellowship hall with the youth. Um, we have a Excuse me, a new class starting today, right? Karen, is your class starting today? Okay, all right, all right. We are starting a K through second grade class, uh, but that's going to start next week. Yeah, so uh, we've had some sickness going around. Other classes are upstairs. We've got uh, Bart's class over in uh, Jim Parker's uh, place over there. We've got the ladies upstairs in my office. Paul's class is in... You're going to meet with the youth today in the fellowship hall. Uh, and uh, so we have the children upstairs in the conference room as well. You know what? We're tight. We're pushed together. That's okay. Because that's actually where we need to be. We need to be close together. We need to be united. Uh, because when we move up to that new place, I want us to explode outward. Right? All right. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, be with us today. Watch over us. Give us your protection. And Lord, mostly... Have your spirit work with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.